I've got a new co-host tonight. This is Crime Watch. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. I'm Jane Cameron with my new co-host, Sergeant Mario Escamilla. I know this is all new to you. Typically, police officers don't like being on camera. Actually, no one does, really. But we know that this is your assignment right now. Um, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself? How long have you been with the department? You know, what are you doing now? Well, I've been on the department for a little over 17 years, and currently I work uh, administrative services. I'm the public information officer, and I'm also in charge uh, with training. You started with the department as an explorer, didn't you? That's correct. I started with the department in 1992 as a police explorer. You know, we've talked about that program often. Evidently, it did prepare you to be a police officer. Is that a, a good stepping stone for um, those younger or older teens who are interested in maybe going into police? Absolutely. It not only prepares them, but it also keeps them away from you know, unnecessary trouble um, and allows them to build the foundation for what they want to accomplish in, fut in future endeavors, uh, not necessarily with just law enforcement, but other aspects within their career. So before this assignment, you were actually one of the sergeants for one of the shifts of patrol, right? Uh, that's correct. I predominantly worked the weekend shift. So that means he's going to find a lot of interesting things for us. Well, you know what? Let's take uh, a ride in your car and see what we can find tonight to show our viewers. Sounds good. How far away is it from here? Just uh, down the street. I'm going to make a left on this main street. See the fire truck behind us. So, Sergeant, right now, you've stopped traffic in the middle of the intersection. What's going on? Uh, there's a reported structure fire uh, right down the street on Dale. And I'm um, uh, trying to get the fire personnel there quicker than uh, everyone else. Do you find that sometimes people don't give them the right of way, even when they've got their, their lights and sirens going? Yes, that is an issue that uh, is a, a major problem quite often won't pull over for them. Now what are they responding on? It's a large structure fire on Dale and Portulaca. It doesn't seem like they're able to find it, but uh, I'm gonna head down that way. So they, they may have gotten a, a little bit um, different information that we got, so I'm gonna head down that way and see if I can point it out to them. Well, it's something like that. Can you directly talk to them and say, hey, no, we don't have it. We don't have the ability to talk to them. You can smell it. Portulac is it's Portulac. Who was the uh, car that I ran for transit? Ronald Ivan Jacobson, 5501 Selma City, Selma Avenue, Arch City. Uh, if there was a house on fire, I'm sure somebody would be flagging this down. So obviously we've left that location and they couldn't find the fire. Is that kind of what happened? That is correct. Uh, both the fire department and uh, Responding police personnel could not find anything in the area. It wasn't bad, though, that the person called. I mean, they thought that there was some type of a fire. So is that okay to make calls like that? Oh, absolutely. If you, if We always preach if you see something, say something. Um, it could have been a variety of things. So, excuse me. 
We're running over a jaywalker. <laughs> and that's another example. You're, they're dark. Anybody crossing the street, they don't have reflective clothing on. It's hard to see them in the dark. It's extremely difficult to see the target, and they barely saw that person. But yeah, getting back to the fire. So yeah, if you if you do see something that you suspect is a fire, regardless of what you're looking at, whether it's smoke or actual flames, it's always best to call the police department because it's better safe than sorry. So we're out at what is a reported shoplifting. That's correct. Now what happens, is it something that usually the inside the house or the store security will call the police department when they've uh, contacted someone? So if someone's suspected of shoplifting, there's, there's a variety of ways on how um, they're seen inside the store. Um, but once they are discovered, they report the incident to the authorities, at which point we get dispatched out here and start the investigation. So what is the role now that the police department does when they've arrested somebody? What happens to that person? Well, it all depends on the, the actual store itself, on whether or not they're desirous of prosecution. Typically, when they do call us out here, they are desirous of prosecution. They actually produce their own reports and provide us with the, you know, the, the correct evidence. Um, and then we, in turn, collect all that evidence and conduct our own investigation and determine whether or not an actual crime has occurred. Has occurred excuse me. Um, and if it has, and we will arrest them and take them to jail, will they be processed? So we're with the officer that went into the store. You know, was when the store gets somebody and puts them under arrest or whatever, is the shoplifter usually a little compliant by the time you show up? For the most part, they, they tend to be. Um, with Walmart, they, they're usually pretty good about calling us. Um, most of their, most of their uh, arrestees tend to be compliant. On occasion, you have somebody that does get uncooperative, but it, it's actually kind of rare. Um, that, that, that occurs. What kind of a penalty or punishment does somebody like this get? Unfortunately, uh, it's not a very lengthy sentence, if any. Um, a lot of these, a lot of the folks that we arrest are uh, transients. So they, uh, like this young lady, she's, she's homeless. So she, uh, if she spends a day in jail, that, that'd be a lot. Most, most of the time it's fines. A lot of times it'll go to tra uh, homeless court. And homeless court, it's usually a diversionary program where they'll get some type of community service in lieu of uh, incarceration. So, you know, this impacts all of us, doesn't it? When people steal things from stores, yeah, it certainly does, and it takes away the the manpower out in the street for us to do other crime prevention and serve the community. That's true. You got pulled away to be able just to transport someone back to the jail. Well, we'll be occupied for about the next 45 minutes to an hour just by, between pro booking her, her photographs, fingerprints, the citation, because she'll be released with a citation in a few hours. Um, so yeah, we'll be, out of, we'll be out of commission for the next hour or so. So that, mean the, that means the officers in the field are a little bit more busy trying to take care of bigger areas in the city while you've got these officers out of commission? Yeah, unfortunately, you're gonna have uh, his uh, partners taking his calls. Um, and additionally, it takes away from their assigned area as well. Ten four. Ten four three thirteen. Thirteen cover.
So we're going to let the sergeant drive, but on the radio, one of the officers tried to pull over a motorcycle with no plates. And obviously, we're in pursuit.
tell me I'll watch your mind. Explain a little bit what was going on now, because I know you were more focused as you should be on driving. Sure. So uh, one of our officers tried to initiate a, a traffic stop on a motorcycle. It was actually what appeared to be a group of motorcycles, but he was focused more on one. But they remained together. Um, the motorcycles that he was trying to stop were the people riding the motorcycles, um, and subsequently they failed stop and uh, pursuit ensued and um, although the speeds weren't you know too dramatic it still is a concern for public safety so we just continued the pursuit. Now safety is I understand important but it must be just frustrating when you are trying to catch someone and you can't right? Yeah that's correct it, it, and in fact we're probably going to see them come out uh, in front of us here the motorcycle that we were chasing. Um, but it is frustrating. But at the end of the day, public safety is more important. Um, you have to weigh the risk versus the reward. And in this instance, um, you know, the public safety is going to outweigh that, uh, that, you know, inherent risk. You know, that was crazy, though, to have five uh, motorcycles staying together I mean that's I, you know even when you see all the pursuits on television you don't normally see something like that no that was actually a first for myself <laughs> I, I've never seen five motorcycles uh, fleeing from law enforcement like that before um, but at the end of the day if, if you looked if you saw the motorcycles they looked um, kind of like a toy motorcycles the smaller versions and modified so they could in fact be young kids uh, not necessarily what we would consider or what most would consider to be criminals so um, that's another reason why we would tend to let them go what about the speeds were the speeds I, I, I mean they weren't following the signals and the traffic signals and such but uh, what were the speeds of the motorcycles yeah that's another thing too is the speeds were I would say probably at the top um, at, at the most 60 miles per hour, but uh, overall, I would say the speeds were about 40 to 50 miles an hour, which is not necessarily, um, you know, a high speed pursuit, but still dangerous given the fact that they're running stop signs, running red lights, so forth and so on. You think maybe they continued because it was kind of a game to have all the, the officers following them? Yeah, of course. And I mean, who knows? It, if it's a group of them, you know, it could be, it could just be a few of them not wanting to stop and actually being the law abiding one might be teased later on. Uh, there's a variety of reasons why they're going to be running, but it could be in fact a, a cat and mouse game. We're with the unit that actually started uh, the pursuit, Officer Bourne. Now, we were actually on a side street and we just saw the red lights go past. What made you want to pull over the motorcycles in the first place? So I was driving westbound Orange Thorpe in the area between Knott and Western and I saw about 30 to 40 small motorcycles and they were doing uh, wheelies and stunts. And at the red light at, at Western, or at Knott, they, uh, they started looking back at me and then they uh, made a U-turn and cars that were traveling uh, westbound had to brake almost nearly hitting them so I actually blocked the traffic so those motorcycles can make a safe u-turn so they wouldn't get hit and then I tried to work my way to the front of the uh, the group to get the leaders and however uh, that's when I initiated the pursuit <laughs> it was an interesting pursuit it it seemed like they knew where they were going I think they had a general idea They're probably local kids that live in the area um, going through some buildings, some side streets, and uh, it just seemed like they, they knew where we could go when they went into the flood channel, and then that's when the pursuit was kind of canceled. Yeah, it's hard to take that car down that flood control side, right? Yeah, at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, the, the, the risk and the reward of capturing 
the uh, arresting the the uh, people we're trying to pursue. You know, do we want to damage the patrol unit, trying to capture the the people, and we don't end up getting them, and now you know we have a, a patrol unit that's deadlined. So we have to we have to weigh in the the risk and the reward. So tell me, as the officer who was actually at the beginning of this pursuit, leading the police cars behind, having five motorcycles that you're following, what's going through your head? Everything, right? Yes. So the most important thing, I looked in my rearview mirror, and I know my, my partners are behind me, so I know they have my back no matter what. Um, like just, if you crash, they know where you stop. Yeah, where I stopped. <laughs> um, just kind of looking at, at side streets, the, the street signs to know where I'm at, just in case of my partner doesn't know. And then I'm also scanning the intersections for pedestrians and uh, uh, crossing vehicles so I don't strike a pedestrian or a vehicle while still maintaining visual of the motorcycles. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm thinking about. So you're trying to figure out where you are and what you're doing as you try to go wherever you're trying to go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're his training officer. What's going through your head? Are you using the radio or are you letting everything be on his shoulders to do it? So I let him use the radio because he's not always going to have somebody riding in his seat, in the passenger seat to do that for him and he's got to figure out how to do that on his own. Um, I kind of want to do it to help the guy out, you know, because we, we're partners, but he's got to learn. He's got to work that out. So he did that and he did fine. Um, but sitting in that seat, I'm, I'm watching all the things he's watching, and then I'm watching him as well, just to make sure that his composure and everything else, is, his conduct during the pursuit is within policy. Uh, if I have to tell him to, to stop the pursuit before a more senior supervisor decides to cancel the pursuit, uh, for whatever reason, so those are other things that are added onto my plate on top of his. So no police cars crashed, the motorcycles didn't crash, although that might have stopped them. No pedestrians were hit. All the civilian cars in the area seemed to stay out of the way of the pursuit, so he did a good job, right? He conducted himself very well in this pursuit, yeah. So you were the third or, f we were the third or fourth car behind. What are you thinking? Because you're not the primary unit, but you're definitely part of the pursuit that's going on. That's correct. Uh, so obviously, uh, Officer Bourne and Cobra Vu are going to be the primary officers. Then you have uh, another officer behind them. Initially, we were the third unit. Uh, but we also had a canine officer with us. I wanted him in front of us in case he was needed for any reason. Um, but essentially, my job is just to oversee and make sure everything is safe, make sure that things are not getting, you know, becoming dangerous for the officers, for the citizens that we're passing, um, obviously the community, and just to make sure the speeds are, are not too excessive. And essentially, they make sure that everyone was, is within policy in accordance to the law. You know, it's not just about driving fast and trying to catch somebody. There's a lot of things that you have to keep in mind when you're doing a pursuit. I, I get the impression it's not taken lightly. No, it's not because you have a lot of people listening. It's uh, everyone has someone to answer to. And we receive extensive training yearly as, as all sworn personnel do. Um, and essentially the first thing that's most important is the safety of the public. Those that that's it, that is the primary focus when engaging in a pursuit, um, and that's what, as Officer Bourne indicated, that risk versus reward factor that we're constantly weighing um, throughout the entire duration of the pursuit. So I have to ask you, driving fast, trying to catch somebody, there's a little bit of a anxiety there, or or just excitement in trying to catch a bad guy, isn't there? You know, I would say more of. Um there is excitement, but in my mind, still trying to stay within policy. That's usually what's going through my mind, the, the risk reward, the danger to the public. Um, it's, it's always a constant reminder, even when you're driving from point A to point B kind of fast, you just you just have to stay within policy and and always, always have the public in, in the back of your mind when you're chasing after these bad guys, because you don't want to be that officer that, that blows that red light and there's, there's someone in the crosswalk. That's why we stop at red lights during a pursuit to clear the intersection while the bad guy's still, you know, traveling in, in the opposite direction. 
Which reminds me of the transient that crossed in the street in front of us. You know, you're still keeping your eyes on the road. You don't want to hit somebody. Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, that's a perfect example of something or some people that you have to consider when engaging in these types of pursuits or anything else. If we, you know, are driving quickly to a call, um, responding what we call code three with our lights and sirens on, that's uh, a perfect example. And if I wasn't paying attention, I would have easily ran that person over, um, which is obviously what we don't want. And if it's not myself, it could be someone else, just a regular citizen driving down the street. All right, suspect, <laughs> let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Sergeant, I know that the Buena Park Police Department has a canine unit. Why is it so important for law enforcement agencies to have canines? So if we have instances where we believe there are dangerous individuals hiding from us, instead of sending an officer inside of a building, um, unfortunately, we would send the dog. I mean, it's, it's a better you know thing to send a dog versus an actual human. Um, and they have better uh, abilities to sense people and they can find people a lot better than we can. Officer Boyington, so your dog's name is? Condor. Condor. Is it a game to him? Uh, is this a, a toy? It is. So the bite sleeve that he, that he was biting, that's a toy to him. Um, we hone in on certain skills that the dog has, um, and we train them to bite a sleeve like that. It was interesting to see the setup where, unfortunately, the officer that was in charge of the pursuit was the victim, and you had him take off his uniform shirt because you didn't want the dog to identify the police officer as being the bite victim. That's correct. Yeah, so when we have decoys, you know, like we did just now, um, we don't want them to have any police uniform or police equipment on. That's to protect both the, the decoy and the dog. So what are uh, Condor's specialties? Uh, Condor is dual trained in both patrol and narcotics. Um, he has five narcotic odors that he can find. Uh, heroin, ecstasy, cocaine, um, heroin, and marijuana. We've talked in the past about how they're helpful for building searches when it would take hours for the officers to do it. Correct. Yeah, so, um, you know, a dog works a lot a lot faster, a lot more efficient than, than a human does. Um, and it doesn't require as many resources to find people that are running from the police. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're great. Pretty cool dog, though. He's a good partner to you, right? Great partner. I've, I've had a lot of fun. If you have any questions about tonight's show, you can call the Buena Park Police Department at 562-3901. Don't forget, they're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can get all the information about what's happening in the community that you need to know. With Sergeant Escamilla, I'm Jane Cameron. Thanks for watching.